Hey everybody, what's going on? You're watching the sit down of DJ Sixsmith, Omar Benson Miller, the unicorn coming back for season two on CBS. Omar, what's up, man? How are you? Listen, I'm good. I'm on my way to the set. I squeeze you in real quick in between busting out scenes. Let's talk about it. How you doing? I'm doing great, man. What has life been like for you last couple months? I mean, you know, doing scenes, COVID-19, it's been a crazy year. How has it been for you? Oh, this year, oh man, it's been that roller coaster of a year, ups and downs and ups and downs. There was a period when the quarantine hit where I turned into a teenager and I just played video games and slept <laughs> until 11 and lifted weights all day. There's been other times where I eat ice cream and hang out and now I'm back with some structure, thank God, and uh, I'm back to... Uh, to shooting scenes and making art that people seem to appreciate. So it's, it's uh, right now life is good. Structure is good, but what was the go-to video game for you during that time? MLB The Show 20, perfect timing. <laughs> Came out, baseball was on a, a hiatus and we didn't know whether or not baseball was happening. And they have this online feature so you can play your friends or strangers. Nope. Forget about it, I'm in, sign me up. And you're a Dodgers fan too, so it's been a great year. Oh yeah, <laughs> oh yeah. A world champion Dodgers fan, please put some respect on that. I mean, it's about time, right? Over 30 years, finally got one again. Ouch. Yeah, it's true. 32 years, man. It's a long time. A lot of the Dodgers fans that watched this World Series hadn't even been born at the last uh, championship. So that's not like L.A., but now we're title town. There Dodgers you go. got them one. Lakers got them one. You know, it's going down. It's a good time right now for LA. It's a good time for you. So let's talk about the unicorn season two. Obviously season one was awesome. It resonated with people. What has this show been like and how is it different from some of the other things we've done in the past? You know, I think this show in particular resonates, especially right now because of the material. Uh, the unicorn is about a man who loses his wife to cancer and we catch up with the story about a year on. And he's left to pick up the pieces to raise his two daughters and to just put his life back together. It's been shattered and really just everything's been fractured. And we found a way to deal with that grief and recovery uh, through comedy. And especially given the ongoing pandemic and the massive amount of losses that people in the world are taking personally, uh, professionally, financially, I think the show has a special relevance right now. And I've been in some stuff that's just fun and fodder, but I, I'm really blessed because I've been able to be in different movies, television shows, plays that have a right now relevance. Ballers was like that. Ballers was relevant right now because of that, that meetup point of sports and finance and celebrity that people love. And now the unicorn has its own version of that, which is about family. It's, a, it's about uh, how it takes a village to raise a community, not just kids, but to keep ourselves sane. And right now there's a lot of coping mechanisms that we all have to figure out given the changes, these drastic changes that are happening in our world. Yeah, that's really well said. And it's really interesting because we are such an open and honest society at times with things, but grief is something we still don't really touch enough. So what does it mean to you that you could help people, whether they're just watching the show or, or dealing with their own stuff? What does that mean to you? You know what, it just warms my heart because this is, this is my job and this is a real joy as an artist. If you can actually affect change in positive ways, this is the real, you know, you get these intrinsic rewards with certain things you do in your life. And the older you get, the more you realize how much more important they are than the extrinsic rewards, than your paycheck, or than, the, you know, any narcissistic component to it, or ego component to it. And for me, I've had people come up to me to talk about this show and, and tell me how it mattered to them because they had just lost their cousin or their brother, or their, you know, their somebody else, or their job. And there's a cathartic element to it. And I tell you, it, it's hard to find a better medicine than laughter. Really hard. Penicillin is right there, but laughter is really, <laughs> really high laughter, on the list. Laughter, penicillin, everything <laughs> else after that. <laughs> so you mentioned ballers before. You and Rob Corddry are basically attached to the hip now that you've done both these shows. What's it been like getting to know him and working with him in two different shows? Oh, you know, Rob and I joke that we're riding each other's coattails to retirement. <laughs> we have a contract with each other that whatever job one of us gets, we got to find a space for the other one. Uh, it's been great. Rob is Rob is a professional. Everybody knows Rob. He's hilarious. And, you know, I think that what this show shows is his ability as a performer beyond comedy bits. Because there's times, and you'll see it on this season, where he has to do some heavy lifting on the dramatic side. Um, because that's what this show, The Unicorn, really does well. It mixes and matches 
the drama of loss and grief with the comedy of life and coping. And Rob gets to do a lot of that. And I mean, I work with Walton on uh, Miracle of St. Anna, the Spike Lee war film. So it, it's a reunion of sorts. And then I have new people that I'm working with and not new anymore, but when we first started last year that I'd never worked with before, like uh, Michaela Watkins, Mylon Robinson. And you know, one thing we got, we got a bunch of kids that are fantastic actors, mm -hmm. a bunch of really cool, cool, sharp kids. So it's a, it's a, it's a little fun show. Give it a shot if you haven't. And I, I haven't had anybody come up to me and say it was a waste of time. So that's good. That's always a good thing. How is season two a little bit different from season one? Well, you know what? In season one, we're just picking up the pieces and, and Wade, we're helping Wade come out of his shell. He's completely shocked. His world has been fractured and he's trying to put together the pieces. Season two, he's at a, a different phase of his recovery. And now we get to explore some more of the idiosyncrasies of society and of each and every couple's uh, uh, personal details in comparison to where we were just introducing everyone in season one. So now I think Wade is farther along as a character. He's looking for love. He's met someone and he's trying to find her. And we get to do a case study on, uh, on that as well as, you know, we do some forensics on what's going on in the world today with race relations and, a lot of other stuff you'll see when uh, you'll see when, when we drop. Really excited to check it out. You mentioned ballers before and playing Charles must have been really fascinating for you because there were so many interesting layers to that show. But his progression was really interesting to me in terms of being a former player, becoming an executive, trying to really, you know, wheel and deal in that world. So what was the coolest part of that show for you? You know, the exposure and that show. Uh, the role was created for me by the show's creator, his name is Steven Levinson. And I had the best character on the show, if you ask me. I had the best story arc, rather, on the show, yeah. if you ask me. Because it was the most realistic and it was the most in-depth. Everyone else in the show was really extreme. I mean, Dwayne even looks extreme. And between his cars and his clothes, and you know what I mean? There's, yeah, there's it not, was a lot. It, wasn't yeah. a, it, it, was, it was aspirational, it's fantasy-based, as opposed to my guy was was really relatable, really identifiable in that sense. And you know what, I got to, I got to be exposed to that world through the research that I was granted to do because of that role and meeting up with former players and talking to them about what it's like to move on in your career and that, that dejected a deflated feeling of going from 100,000 people cheering for you to just being at home and how, you know, the adjustments that have to take place so I really, you know, I really, that, that show changed my life. And it was a wonderful gig. Got to shoot out in Miami for a couple of years. So I would have done that for minimum wage. It was great. <laughs> it's great. That's awesome, man. You ever get a lift in with The Rock or you just let him do his thing uh, before shooting started? Now he's a maniac in the gym. So, <laughs> you know, I'll go to the side and lift my smaller dumbbells <laughs> and let him handle the iron paradise, brother. But he's... Uh, he was the best, man. Dwayne was a great number one to work with. And he really, uh, you know, he, he really was a general on the show. And he brought so many eyes, you know, and that, that's that's something that's so generous and benevolent about him is that he'll use his light and shift it towards you. And what you do with it from that point is on you. What me and Rob did with it was go on network television and do a new TV show. <laughs> Very true. You mentioned just the importance of somebody using their light and putting it on other people. I, I could put Spike Lee right there too. And you mentioned working with him. I mean, he's an amazing artist and he's done tremendous work. What separates him from some of the rest in your opinion? Well, I would say in a lot of ways, what separates Spike is the fact that as a black man, Spike will allow you to be a dynamic whole man in the film. You don't have to defer as a character or as a, a monolith in any way. And Spike gives you humanity as an opportunity for an artist. And unfortunately, especially when he was getting first getting started, that wasn't really commonplace in Hollywood. And so for me, Spike, he, man, he, he shared his light with me and it changed my life. Because for one, he asked me to lose 70 pounds to be in the movie. Um, and that changed my life in a positive way. My knees to really <laughs> thank him for it. Uh, so there was that. We shot the film in Italy. We shot the film on uh, four countries or something like that. So that changed my life and the content of what we were able to do. Spike is the kind of guy that's not a lot of rehearsal. There's not even a lot of excess direction. Uh, if you're a prepared 
performer, Spike is great for you because the job is getting the job with him. And he has so much confidence in casting the right people, which his track record shows that he does, that if you're prepared, you can lay down what you've prepared in his films and he'll make you look like gold, which is, you know, which is all you can ask for. It's a good person to be with. So Omar, you've been doing this thing for a minute, man. Take me back to the early days. Eight Mile has been a film that has had legs for several decades at this point. What do you remember from filming that one? I can remember every single day. <laughs> that was that that I was sleeping on my mom's floor when I got the word that I got that uh, <laughs> that I got that movie, and I had just gotten out of college. And I remember I was supposed to go to an audition on 9/11, as a oh, matter wow. of fact. And uh, I think that's one of the reasons why it has such hyper focus in my mind. And uh, Obviously, the world changed after that, and the process of getting the job to actually getting the job and then starting rehearsal, uh, working with Curtis Hansen, uh, he, rest in peace, he's passed on, but Curtis is quite possibly the best that I've ever worked with. He, he did uh, L.A. Confidential, and Hand of Rock's Cradle, all these wonderful films, and um, he taught me so much because that movie was really hard to make, and if you go back and you look at the cast in that film, Man, there's a lot of talent in that film. And, uh, you know, a lot of people, unfortunately, have passed on in that film as well. And the others of us who are still here have wonderful careers. So that movie, <laughs> another person, there was no bigger star in the world than Eminem when we did that film, not in the entire world. And, you know, he was, that was his first real film and his last, really. Yeah. Uh, and he, uh, he was great to work with. And we all leaned on each other. We were all 20, early 20 year old men trying to figure out our lives, you know? And he was doing it under the glare of the most enormous microscope in the world. It's really interesting to peel back the layers on something like that. And before I let you go, you got this really amazing piece of artwork behind you here with uh, some of the lives that have been lost because of, you know, the terrible things that have happened in our country here with Trayvon Martin and so many other people. Where did you get that piece of art? And why is it so important to be talking about the people that we lost in order to? things like oh this man thank you thank you for asking you know what uh this piece is called the race card it's by an artist named keenan chapman and he's from los angeles and i do believe he lives down in georgia now and you know what i saw this piece and i had worked with him as a storyboard artist on a film and i saw this piece and it just really moved me and i've had this since 2016 i think he did it shortly after george zimmerman was set free after killing trayvon martin and, you know, it's a constant reminder of where we are in society and things that we need to change. The names on here, unfortunately, you could have 50 of these pieces from this point. And it's, it just is a reminder of where we are in America and that things can get better, but we have to acknowledge what's going on and what has happened in the past if we wanna actually move forward. And that's the challenge. We have to be honest with ourselves about what's going on. It's unacceptable for any one particular group to be targeted. And it's clear that, that, that we, as Black people, have been targeted. But now we can pick up the pieces, hopefully, and move forward. And that's the choice we all have to make. So I keep this here. It's in a you know, prominent place in my living room. As you can see, as the sun is coming up, it's right there. And uh, it's, it's just a constant memory for, for plenty of the people that we've lost. Well, I appreciate you laying it all down here. Love your work. And really looking forward to season two. Omar, thanks so much for the time, man. And uh, enjoy getting back on set, all right? All right, DJ. Have a good one.